Well, I am excited to introduce to you our next panel guest, Ron Friedman. Ron produced two drafts for Transformers the movie, one, of, one about which is little is known that you can ask him about in a few moments, and the one which would be developed into the finished film. Feel free to come up and be embarrassing. It'll be awesome. Speak freely. What's the worst that can happen? <laughs> ah, without further ado, let's give it up for Ron Friedman again. Thank Woo. you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I am Ron Friedman. Those of you who are expecting somebody else, you're screwed. <laughs> but, yo, Joe, wrong room. I created G.I. Joe. I also created the Bionic Six, Defenders of the Earth, and with Stan Lee, my former frequent writing partner and friend, the Marvel Action Hour. And in so-called real television, I have more than 700 hours of mostly prime time. All in the Family, The Andy Griffith Show, Get Smart, Barney Miller, The Odd Couple, Bewitched, Fantasy Island, The Blind, The Blind, Starsky and Hutch, and if you watched all of that, it explains why none of you went to medical school. <laughs> but the Transformers surprised me. I did not want to kill Optimus Prime. I told Hasbro, if you kill him, he will have to be brought back. They said, never. 90 days later, he was back. <laughs> He's still back. You can't kill Optimus Prime any more than you can kill Zeus in Greek mythology. How about knocking off Odin in Norse mythology? Who do you replace him with? Sven, the herring salesman? You can't do it. Anyway, for years, and I mean years, strangers would approach me on the street and say, you son of a bitch. I was seven years old, and I went to see the Transformers, and you killed Optimus Prime! Would you sign my underwear? <laughs> I have signed underwear. I'll be happy to sign your underwear if it's reasonably sanitary. But the Transformers has given me great pleasure, because at the time I was doing it, I felt a real responsibility to move the idea of the Transformers beyond where the series was. I rewrote the first 60 episodes, which were then largely about Energon. The Decepticons wanted it, the Transformers had it. The Transformers wanted it, the Decepticons had it. Almost every episode. And there were no human beings, and no girls, no women. So I said, I want to have a female Autobot. Unheard of. Well, R.C. was, still is, because my daughter liked the Transformers, and I figured if she did, other girls liked it too. So it's not a limited to men only. This is universal. It is a universal product. Mm -hmm. I also said that I want to kill some Autobots. Why did I want to do that? Because I learned from Walt Disney that in order to tell a story that's compelling and emotionally revealing, there has to be light and dark. There has to be life and death. Snow White, Pinocchio, name the great Disney movie. The threat of the loss of life is very much present because that's for real. So I was told, OK, you can knock off these guys. We're not that crazy about them. But you must also kill Optimus Prime. And I said, nay. I thought I'd use the Shakespearean term maybe to shame them into backing off. But they didn't. At any rate, I tried to go beyond what Energon torment of the moment to get into the humanity of the Transformers, because I will now confess to something I believe is absolutely true, and it took me years to actually get a close handle on it. We are all Transformers. When we're young and we see injustice or injustices acted upon us, we want to change that. 
we want to have our view spoken out and listened to. This is wrong, we say, but we're little, we're small. Nobody listens to kids, ever. And so what we do, if we're creative and imaginative, is we look for a universe in, we're, in which what we care about works, in, in which what is good always wins. What is good is always recognized as good. And what is not good is dealt with. It's not accepted. It's not acceptable. But we have to transform from those frightened, angry kids into grown-ups, into adults who can make that change, make that difference. And the heartwarming thing I found from meeting Transformers fans is that you are all positive. You are all hopeful. You are all still transforming into becoming those who make the difference that's crucial. I think that's important. And I think that it's not just comic books, and it's not just animation, and it's not just strange toys that sell for a lot of money. It's this idea that transforming is what life is about, particularly when the transformation is into being better, into making a difference for the good. So I salute all of you for your imagination and your positive nature, and it gives me great joy to be in your presence and recognize that we are one. I'm still the same starry-eyed, once upon a time kid that wants to believe that it can be better and that we will make it better. Thank you. And now that I've shown you a bit of my heart, you're going to show me a bit of your strangeness <laughs> and ask any question that comes to mind. Hi, Ron. Hi. Thank, first off, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. And uh, sec second off, uh, you had me sold at We Are All Transformers. Yes, so, I yeah. believe that. <laughs> and thank you for that. It was a wonderful speech. Um, so one thing I've just noticed sitting here and listening to you, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing you, I'm listening to your words, also listening to your voice, and you sound so familiar. Did you... Uh, Beyond doing writing for Transformers, did you do voices in the TV shows? I've done voices, but not on the Transformers. Okay. I did voices on the Marvel Action Hour and some other things, and then Peanuts and like that. Okay. So my biggest, deepest voice was this Blastar, Blastar in the Marvel Action Hour. Great. Nobody knows who the hell Blastar is. And if you're lucky, you never will. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Good morning. Hi. My, qu my question is, um, when the writers told you to make Ultra Magnus the leader, and then they switched him out to Hot Rod, what was your personal opinion on that? Well, nobody told me to do that. I decided to do that because I had to replace Optimus Prime. And so the idea was to get a kind of teenage Autobot who would become the new leader. So I did the best I could do to, to honor that, although throughout I was really disappointed that I had to kill Optimus Prime. Because here, here's the way I look at writing and most writers do. What does everyone recognize, understand instantly? instantly, without any preparation, without any study, without the necessity of having seen a dozen things before to prepare you. What everyone understands is a family. We all understand if there's a crazy uncle who exposes himself in front of a school bus. Do any of you need explanation about a crazy relative? How many have a crazy relative? Show of hands. How about that? It's everybody. <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. 
So how many people know who Big Daddy is? Well, Big Daddy doesn't have to be a daddy. Big Daddy can be a mommy or an uncle. Big Daddy can be Big Brother. That's somebody in a family to whom everyone else looks. It's the someone in the family that always makes sense. It's the someone in the family that says, don't eat that, you don't know where it's been. We understand. So if you recognize that the Autobots are a family, and a good family, and the Decepticons are a family, but a bad family, you are suddenly in the story, you, however old you are, you understand who is who, and you understand how the family works. Now, Tolstoy said, every happy family is the same. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. So, the Decepticons are an unhappy family, and that means they don't trust each other, and they shouldn't. They can't rely on each other, and they can't. They are always vying to take the leadership role no matter what it costs everyone else. That's a bad family. In a good family, everyone loves one another. And if they don't, they make allowances for what's not perfect. And because they love, they help each other. They can be relied upon to be there when things get difficult. So constructing a family is what every writer does. And then the universe you put the family in, it doesn't matter if it's under the sea, it doesn't matter if it's a, a different galaxy, it doesn't matter if it's a different plane of existence. If it's a family, we're there. We know, we understand. And again, that's why I didn't want to kill Optimus Prime. He was the center of the Autobot family. So I don't know if I answered your question, but I certainly answered mine. <laughs> Thanks. Just one more. Yes. Uh, question I think everybody's been asking for over 20 years. Who's Cyclonus? Which one did they actually use to make his body? That is secret information that's sealed in a vault under Hasbro's backyard. I will be happy to reveal it for thousands of dollars after this is over. I'll meet you in the back alley. <laughs> Good morning, sir. Hi there. Um, this is a question I asked of Flint Dilly. It's rather frivolous. Uh, I know Flint, and I'm sure you got an unusual answer. Uh, yes. Um, it, it, this is the day after uh, he did a sort of live commentary on a screening of the film, uh, and I fully expected the answer to have been lost to the mists of history, but since you're here, I'll, I'll ask it again. Please. Ba weep grana weep ninibong. Origin? Page 175 of the Oxford International Dictionary under what the hell is that? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, as I bumped into you earlier. You did. <laughs> and I just wanted to formally apologize for it because... I hope everybody heard that because otherwise I was planning to sue. <laughs> but... But thank you. Thank you for that. That's basically it. That was it? Yeah. Let's give him a round of applause. The nurse will be here to take him back to the home a little later. How do I follow that up? Um, it, it, on your writing on G.I. Joe and on Transformers, you included a lot of female characters. Yes. Uh, more so than was usual for the time. And they also received a lot of depth and a lot of attention. Uh, what was your, your methodology behind that, and who did you look to for inspiration? Well, here's what made me a feminist. My father died when I was 11, and suddenly the men that had always treated my mother nicely were not treating her nicely. They were discounting her, they were hitting on her, they were really not the guys I knew. They changed. She didn't change, and my thought was, this is wrong. You can't do that. That's not the way it's supposed to be. She's a person, she's intelligent, she's not a fool. She didn't suddenly become a fool and a person of no consequence because she was now a widow and not a married woman. So I began to think about that and I always had girls who were friends. It never occurred to me, you can't be friends with a girl. You're either looking for action or you're, you're, you know, you're, you're crazy, you're not a real guy. So my feeling was, why exclude girls, women, from this wonderful world of entertainment? 
Why shouldn't they be participants? And I've known some really potent women that you would love to know, and you would not be questioning, is this a man or a woman? You would say, this is a good guy. This is somebody I want to know. This is somebody who's smart. This is somebody who thinks like I do. And forget about the gender, because when you know people, they fall into two categories, the good guys and the idiots. That's it. You don't need to put that on the, the, the door of a toilet, good guys and idiots, but it's basically that. And when you look at life that way, you figure, who am I to exclude anyone? Because here's the way I look at it. Each of us is the pope and a serial killer. Each of us is a great actor and a shy person who hides in the attic. In other words, each of us is everyone. So whoever is prejudiced gets up in the morning, looks in the mirror and goes, screw me. Can't be that way. And that's why I wanted to be sure that the females had as much opportunity to act up and kick Decepticon ass or Cobra ass, if Cobras have one, <laughs> as anybody else. So that's where that comes from. And I haven't changed, but it was that moment in my personal history when my father died and I saw how everyone reacted to my mother that it made me a feminist. That's it. Thank you very much. I know this might be a difficult to answer with all, all your many writing credits throughout the years, but uh, was there anything that did not make it into the Transformers movie that you wrote that you really, really wanted to? Yeah, there were a bunch of things, but here's what happened. I was substantially happy with what did get made, and so in the interests of not becoming depressed, I immediately forgot what didn't get in. <laughs> because part of life is just getting on with it. Whether it works or not, you've made your peace with the moment by doing what's required of you to the best of your ability. And then if you want to live a more productive, creative life, you just get on with it and keep moving. And one of the encouraging things about being in the arts, and I'm now going to make this announcement, this is all about art. Really, it's all about art, which is seeing the world through the eyes of an artist so that what is familiar to us when seen through the eyes of an artist makes us say, wow, oh boy, I was unaware that I was watching this or part of this. So when we're doing this, we are performing a valuable service that I can describe this way, which I often do to my students, because I've been teaching writing 18 years at USC and 15 at Chapman University. It's this, how many still life paintings have you seen? It's always the checkered tablecloth, the bottle of wine, the bunch of grapes, maybe some flowers, maybe a piece of ham, infinite number of times. But each time you see it reinterpreted by a different artist, it's like, you're seeing it for the first time. And any time we see something for the first time, it restores our faith in life. It makes us aware of this gift we have, which is called breathing and being aware. And so the Transformers, animation, comic books, speculative fiction, all of this wonderful stuff is just a way to remind us of the beauty of existence and of our part in making it more beautiful. Thanks, sir. You're welcome. Hi, Ron. Hi. Uh, my son, Alex, just wanted to say a quick thank you. Okay. To you, uh, Hi, Alex. Um, thank you for making the movie. I really like the movie. I really appreciate that, Alex. Thank you very much. I'm going to give you a round of applause. Let's hear it for Alex. Uh, you kind of anticipated my first question, which was if the, uh, in the TV series, if the credit you received for it, additional dialogue by Ron Friedman, really did justice to your job and your role on the show. It sounds like you completely overhauled the, uh, the scripts in large part, and if you wanted to touch on that more, that'd be great. I'd love to hear a bit more about it. But my main question was the Megatron-Starscream dynamic, that relationship, 
I had a theory on what the archetypal kind of family relationship that you were talking about was with those two, but I mean, that was the highlight of the original series and the movie for me, for that matter. They were just great, and it made that show just jump off the screen. It was always just so I, much I'm, fun to watch, but I had a theory on that. I wanted to hear it direct from the source, though. What were you thinking when you're writing those two? Well, when I tell you what them? I was thinking, you're going to go, nah, wait a minute. <laughs> I was thinking Shakespeare. I was thinking Shakespearean villainy, in which the villains are well-spoken, in which they express their contempt for each other in ways that are memorable, in which you can see their evil machinations that are each based on the same phenomenon, which is, I'm the one that's important. I'm the only one that matters. I am the bringer of all goodness and knowledge. When those people confront each other, it should be a festival of fireworks, and Shakespeare did that brilliantly. So my attempt was to do that. And the same with Destro and the Cobra Commander. Again, I look to Shakespeare for showing these two warring supposed allies, each waiting to destroy the other one. And that was it, checking to Will Shakespeare. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Hey, Raul. Um, Hi. Um, uh, first, I want to thank you for uh, the, uh, you know, the, the Transformers, the movie. Oh, it's really important in my life. Okay. To mine, too. Well, it, it inspired me a lot, and it, and it changes my life tremendously. So, yeah, I want to thank you first. You're very welcome. I thank you for, for loving it. I really do. It, it's, it's wonderful to have something that I did so long ago that still works, that still delivers a kick to those that watch and like it, that still brought you all here from who knows how far away. Uh, I'm thrilled to be part of that. I've written so many things, and fortunately, a lot of them still remain viable. I know because I get residual checks for 39 cents from, <laughs> from all over the world. But, you know, when I say I wrote 700 hours of mostly primetime top 10 television, that's right, about equally divided between drama and comedy. So that's a lot of shows, and most of them are still running. So obviously, the storytelling is good, and you are proof that the storytelling still works, and I'm thrilled. I really, I like myself better knowing this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Let's hear it for me. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So I just want to ask some questions. Yes. Um, yeah, you mentioned that a, the Transformers, the movie, is in some way a movie about families, and the Autobots are, and the Decepticons are families too. Yes. So, um, I, w I was just cur cur curious that, uh, what do you think that Unicron played the role in, with between these two families? Well, it's, it's a classical kind of conflict that takes place between families and governments and princelings and commoners in which the basis of it is, I want what you have. This is mine, you can't have it. Then I will take it unless you can prevent me. This is so basic, it's what bullies do. Is this the law of the jungle? Well, how many want to live in a jungle? We don't. We do not want to have to be alert to having our food stolen and being killed during the night. That's not civilization. Families are the beginning of civilization because it's the defense of the family unit. And who attacks the family? other families. So this is the age-old story of mankind. 
And what's new and different is the idea of democracy and the idea of people of goodwill can band together and become as powerful as those who are corrupt and dangerous, but that they will not overstep themselves and determine that they must have what everybody else has. So anytime a story reminds anybody of any of those truths, that story is going to work, it's going to have impact, and it's going to touch us here where it matters. So that's, that's the best I can do. Oh, thank you, thank you, thanks a lot. You're welcome. I want to This is a rule I keep forgetting. Uh, we're trying to limit the questions to one or two. If you have more, please get back in line. But we want to get through everybody because we, we do okay. have limited time. I'm should sorry, I, I should have mentioned that, and should, that's my bad. Should I talk faster? So if I talk like this, we'll get more questions in? <laughs> I'll be very happy to do that if that will help. We'll, we'll okay. do what we can. Okay. Uh, hi. First of all, I'd like to thank you for creating an awesome movie like this. And second, it's an honor to meet you. Uh, I question, appreciate that. I'm honored to meet you. Thank you. Uh, but what was your favorite scene in the movie? What was the what? What was your favorite scene? Uh, I've got to tell you, I don't have favorite scenes or favorite characters. Uh, a lot of other people have said just what I'm going to say, is when you are in the business of creating stories and characters and so on, they're all your favorites, particularly when you get paid for writing them. That <laughs> Really, you want to become my favorite, just hand me a few bucks, and I will suddenly say, Boy, hey, you know, there's a lot about you I like. So it's called making a living, but it's also the kind of great joy, the great feedback that every artist gets when what he or she has made is found to be delightful and, and useful. Nice. Hello. Hi. Uh, I have a question more on the, the concept of Unicron, like the whole thing about sure. him being a whole planet and like really a transformer unlike any other. Uh, how much of him was like your ideas or how much of it was any of Hasbro or no, any of the powers? No, it, it that was he... all my idea because I was given write a Transformers feature. That was it. That was my assignment. And so I liked the idea of Unicron because I wanted to create something that was enormous and ever transforming, but transforming by absorbing other life forms, other worlds. A, power, a powerful enemy that required normal enemies to unite to defeat that powerful enemy. And I have an interesting Orson Welles story because I knew Orson Welles. Does everybody know who Orson Welles was these days? Well, I, it, good, I'm, I'm glad you do. Anyway, I, I, I met Orson and uh, before I did, I was working with Lucille Ball. And I said, I'm, I'm gonna meet Orson Welles. She said, well, let me tell you an Orson story. She said, when Desi and I got Desi Lou, Desi said, we're gonna need product. We're gonna have to create things that are gonna be on television. What should we do? Who can we get? And Lucy said, what about Orson Welles? And Desi said, well, that's great, he's brilliant. Where is Orson? She said, he's living at the Chateau Marmont He's behind six months in his rent. He owes $100,000 to a liquor store and $200,000 to his tailor who keeps making bigger suits for him because he's putting on 10 pounds a day. And he's also charging hookers and liquor store on credit cards and he's maxed out. Desi said, let's, let's pay all of his bills and put him in one of our houses in Palm Springs and then we'll give him some charge accounts there and he'll write something fabulous for us and we'll be a hit. That's what they did. Six months goes by, nothing. He's running up bills on credit cards for hookers and liquor stores, same thing in Palm Springs. So Lucy said, Desi waked me at four in the morning drunk and he had his gun out and he said, I'm going to Palm Springs and I'm gonna kill Orson. <laughs> she said, that's not a good idea, De uh, Desi. Get some sleep. He said, no, I'm going. And he drove off. She said, I didn't know for 24 hours if he had killed Orson or not. <laughs> and he returned home. 
And I said, did you kill Orson? He said, not yet. <laughs> I put the gun in his nose and I said, you have two weeks to give us something or I'm coming back and I'm killing you. <laughs> Four days later, by limo from Palm Springs, Orson's script was delivered. It was brilliant. They did this show on television. It won every award imaginable. It broke the fourth wall where the characters would talk to the camera, and it was about the fountain of youth. It was sensational. Desi went to Orson with Lucy, and he said, that was just great, but we need more programming. What are we gonna do next? Orson said, nothing, I'm so tired. I just wanna to go to Europe and relax. Lucy said it took her 20 minutes to wrestle the gun away from Desi. <laughs> Anyway, thank that, you. you bet. Congratulations on the character of Unicron. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> yes. Hello. Hi. Um, I was wondering, when you were first writing Hot Rod, and by extension Rodimus, what were you aiming for? And by extension, how did, did, were you surprised by the reaction you got by the fans after the movie came out? First, answering that, I wasn't surprised at all because I was a fan and I was pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> and with Rodimus Prime, what I tried to do was just come up with a character who was interesting enough that maybe people would like him enough just to get through the movie without rebelling in the theater and attacking the ushers and setting fire to the box office. <laughs> so it's called try to do what I hope will work and get me off the hook. I confess, that was it. <laughs> Oh, hello, Juan. Hi. Oh, um, by the way, thank you for bringing us the uh, movie. And oh. I really enjoy it. And you have no idea how many times I've watched it. My <laughs> psychiatrist actually have a case on it. Why? <laughs> well, I'm just kidding. Anyway, I have two couple of questions. Um, the first one is um, the movie. When you write a script, do you actually have two movies or two stories in mind? Because if you watch it so many times, you realize that the first part is very different from the second. Well, so. I, actually, I wrote two completely different movies for the movie, The Transformers, the movie. The first one I wrote, uh, Griffin and Bacall, who were the sort of uh, story editors and advertising agency for Hasbro, said I had made the Decepticons too interesting. <laughs> I don't know. I like interesting villains. I think they are, yes, I think they are what you, what you really need. They said they wanted another script where the, Decepti where the Autobots were the more charming. So I wrote a second script, and the second script is the one they shot. But when the live action movies were made, Michael Bay took from both of those scripts for the first two live action movies. So I like to say the parts of the live action movies that worked were what I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> Did you pay him? Uh, I, I got nothing for them, <laughs> and uh, I still, that still bothers me. But that's, the, that's life, and what can I do? <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, my last question. Um, do you actually wrote the line, is the whooper all right? I probably did. <laughs> I, I, I don't remember. I, I, I plead complete ignorance and guilt, because I, I've written, if, if you would have all of the scripts I wrote, it would at least weigh 800 pounds. And, and I do not remember everything. Okay, no Forgive problem. me. No Where problem, am I? No Where am I? That's right. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much for coming here to spend time with us. Today. I'm thrilled really to be here. Um, one of the things that I, I think really stands out in terms of the writing of the movie that was really interesting and very different was the junkions and the way that they spoke. What inspired that? I, I'm glad you liked that. Uh, this was at a time when junk bonds were in, and junk bonds created junk love, and junk music, and junk everything. And what is junk? Junk is usually the disposed of odds and ends that are hot for a moment and then vanish, like the pet rock, and other such phenomena. So I thought, why not an extraterrestrial place that's been monitoring Earth television and radio and music for years 
And what they do is pick up the odds and ends. But wait, that's not all. And the Ginzu steak knife will come with this. You know, friends, friends, for two, five, et cetera. And I thought, great. So there's a whole planet of junk, and everybody there is a junk neon, and what they do is parrot these odds and ends. But I'm glad you like that, because I like that, and I was proud of that. Thank you for creating that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no, no, Hasbro created nothing. They just said, write a Transformers feature movie. That was my marching orders. Well, I think we all love that they talk TV, so yeah. thank you so much. Thank you, boy. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Hello again. Hello again. Uh, in the aftermath of the Transformers movie, there were changes then made to the G.I. Joe movie, or So the Legend Goes, which you also, I believe, wrote. Uh, that's the legend, but I don't really know. Okay. Because uh, the story about writers and show business is this. Did you hear about the low IQ starlet. She's having an affair with the writer, which means, can the writer help her? No. Do they tell the writer anything? Usually not. These decisions that are creative decisions are made by people who are creative because it's on their, their business card. <laughs> creative executive. So they are, pro they are proclaimed to be creative, but they usually are not. And very often, the decisions they make fly in the face of doing anything original or new or different. So as to changing Duke's death in uh, G.I. Joe, I have no idea how that happened. None. OK. Actually, my question was going to be, um, were there any such changes made during the pre-production of the Transformers movie? You talked about the two scripts. Were there any other major changes to characters or, or to various arcs or even details in, of how the, the no, plot progressed? No. In the two scripts, uh, RC was there, Sp the Spike was there, and so on. But there were just different focuses on the activity and some different transformations, which, again, Michael Bay uh, cannibalized in the first two feature films. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <clears throat> Hello again. Yes. So I have a question about Galvatron in the movie. Mm -hmm. you, Megatron, you wrote Megatron getting turned into Galvatron. Yes. So this is about a two-part question that's really, you could probably answer with one. Uh, where did you get the idea to turn Megatron into Galvatron? And was there ever a plan for Megatron character to actually die and then get replaced by a completely separate character called Galvatron? Well, to answer the second question first, there was never a plan to move Megatron around and uh, replace him with a Galvatron. The movie's called Transformers, right? Mm -hmm. Well, look at, look at transformation this way. What is religion all about? Religion is all about an explanation for the transformation of birth. We don't know where we came from and suddenly we're there. And then we're transformed as we live into people, supposedly. And then where do we go when we die? Well, if religion is true, we are transformed again. We assume a new identity in a new universe. So the transformation situation is transcendental. It never ends. So I wanted to take a transforming character, Megatron, and transform him through death to Galvatron, so as to continue the process. Where it ends, where it begins, is completely up to the imagination of the creator. And so that's what I wanted to suggest and lock in place, because it opens a world of possibilities if we feel that there is a potential for those that have gone to return in a different form, then what's the next form? Anyway, I wanted to raise questions, pull back some obstacles to open the idea of a continuing ev evolution and thought and existence. Thank you so much for doing so. It was absolutely wonderful. You, Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yes, services will be at sundown. <laughs> and we will transform into another universe. So 
As a screenplay writer myself, I have to say this is one of my favorite screenplays of all time. I thank um, you. The dialogue specifically is unbelievable. I'm just wondering, is there a bit of dialogue in the movie that you wish you wrote? Like something that maybe you heard someone say or an actor improv And nope. if not, what's, what's your favorite dialogue that you wrote in the film? I like it all or it wouldn't have been there. <laughs> because I do everything in my mind when I write it. And if it works for me, because I've been an actor, I, I know what that life is like. I know what is expected of an actor. In other words, everybody that's involved in any kind of creative project, and unfortunately filmmaking, and it's collaborative. If you're a collaborator in a war, they shoot you after the war is over. But in film and television, you must collaborate. So uh, I was given no instruction, and what I did was follow my best instincts to try to make something that was appealing and that worked. Awesome, thank you. You're welcome. <coughs> my me. pleasure. My daughter asked me a while back uh, who my favorite character was, and I had to admit um, I enjoy Megatron. I, I really like seeing him put the boots down. I did too. You know, I don't like seeing him win. I don't want to see him win, but I really like <laughs> watching the face off. The bad guys are always more fun to play. They are. Yeah, and uh, and I always enjoyed the part about where, especially with Megatron, he um, there's a plan within a plan within a plan. It seems you never really know what he's doing, and you don't know what's coming until it happens. And so I really like that way that plays out. It reminds me of um, uh, Star Trek DS9 when the uh, Cardassian characters, a Klingon made the comment one time, <laughs> when you're battling these guys, you don't know what they're up to because it's a plan within a plan within a plan. And, and I enjoyed the reoccurrence in that story writing. It's not common. Um, my, my daughter had a question that uh, she wanted me to, uh, to ask you. Um, when you killed Optimus, did you realize how it, become, it would become a reoccurring tradition? I didn't want to do it. I repeat that. Yeah. I was forced to do it. If they hadn't yeah. paid me, I wouldn't have done it. But, you know, I can be bought. <laughs> and I, I did anticipate there'd be an outcry because I still identify with kids. I'm, as far as enjoying myself and being open to wonderment, I still am. So I thought, if I were a kid, how would I feel? I'd be pissed off. Mm -hmm. But kids aren't writing my check. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. let them get over it. It'll, it'll toughen them up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I apologize philosophically. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Oh, where are you? Hi, there you go. We're at the 10 minute mark, so it looks like we'll be able to get everybody to answer their, quest their questions answered. Oh, you got one? Ask excellent, okay. Go ahead. There you go. All right. Hello again. Oh, hey, hi, it's me again. Yes. <laughs> So, uh, uh, I, I have one more question. So, so uh, would you like to tell us um, how, um, how did you interact with Orson Welles? With Orson Welles? Yeah. I, I will tell you. <clears throat> I was supposed to meet Orson at the Polo Lounge in the Beverly Hills Hotel. But I had met him with mutual friends before, and this was just to say hello because he knew I knew Lucy Ball. And I, when I saw him, I said, Lucy told me a story. He said, it's all true. <laughs> he said, it is not only true, but I wish Desi were still alive because he'd give me a job. Because <laughs> nobody would. Now, when I came upon Orson sitting in the polo lounge, there was a couple from the valley taking photographs of him, and he was furious. He said, I'm not Mount Rushmore. You can't just come in and snap me. You need my permission. And they apologized and left. And then I said, Lucy told me, it's all true. All true. And then he added this, the fault, dear Brutus, lies not in our stars, but in ourselves that we allow ourselves to be ruled by assholes. <laughs> I quote Orson Welles exactly. <laughs> That's it. Thank you so much. Oh, thank You're welcome. You so much. Oh boy, thank you. Hi, sir, it's an Hi. honor. <laughs> um, I heard what you said about the Megatron Starscream dynamic earlier, and I was wondering, uh, 
What about the Megatron Soundwave Starscream dynamic? Like, how does Soundwave fit in the whole thing? Like, what were you thinking, like, in the movie when he saved Megatron the first time, but didn't when he was being thrown out the airlock? I was just trying to keep the story going and changing it along the way so that the audience could not anticipate what was coming next. Mm. So I always look for things that will surprise the audience, but that they can recognize as fitting. And so it's not like something comes in suddenly and they can't buy it. So it had to be in character, and it had to come at a time when the audience was expecting some other situation to take place. That, that is what you have to do if you're going to keep someone interested. Thank you. You're welcome. Here you go. Hi, Ron. Hi. Uh, my question is about um, the characters who I found probably really mysterious and interesting, uh, the Quintessons. I was just curious, what was the inspiration or the source for them? Just creating some other hostile force that had a different look so that it's not always the same face on the same kind of enemy. Because once you do that, you bore the audience. And also, I wanted to create something in animation that would have been exciting. Uh, actually, considering the time constraints and the money, it came out pretty well. But my description of the change of the face of the Quintesson leader was far more elaborate than was actually animated. And I was always sorry about that. But in the real world, you can only do what you can afford to do. And they were doing it fast. They had to do it fast because of the budget. So in the universe of the possible, they did a great job. In the university of my mind, what I envisioned, mm, but good enough. Great. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Uh, hi. Hi. This has been one of the best panels I've ever listened into, and um, I was thinking about what you said about transformation and whatnot. And as someone who wants to do some writing for shows and whatnot, I hadn't really thought about. I hadn't really thought about that impact on kind of the stories that I've been writing, but I realized that it was there without me realizing it. And I wanted to ask you, what's the best advice you could give to someone who wants to develop? their stories more for a um, larger audience and TV okay. or anything like that. That's a legitimate question. And in teaching this for many years at USC and now at Chapman, and my students are very successful. They've won Emmys and uh, Tonys and so on. The answer is, if you feel that doing that is, is good, that it's you, that it's a part of you that feels natural, and that you derive great pleasure in exercising that, then go for it. Don't be dissuaded because nobody wants to reward an artist with good news. If you're a parent and your kid comes up to you and says, Dad, I'm going to be an actor, you immediately, after you just smack them with a brick, <laughs> say, are you out of your mind? Are you nuts? Can't make a living doing that. You know how many people want to be an actor? You know how many people want to be a writer? You know how many people want to be a writer? Blah, 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 blah. In other words, you can't, you shouldn't, don't dream of it. Forget about it. You're crazy. Ignore that. Because if you feel it's right and it's within you, it is. And the way you pursue it is by doing it, by actually writing. Every word you write as you begin is your instructor. You begin to see what your mind is capable of delivering, and it has been put there so that you can consider it and think it over. As you begin to do more of that, you will begin to educate yourself. Additionally, just keep writing and always look for the truth. What is the truth you want to tell? And if you're very successful and you get an award, I want the money. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. We are at the five minute mark, so we're going to try really hard to get these last three, but if we don't get to them, All right, I'm I will sorry. speak faster. I will offer to speak faster before. I'll do it again now. If it says hello, Go what do you it. want? Okay, good. The answer is Megatron, it's Philadelphia, <laughs> 1942. Thank you. Next. <laughs> Hi, um, I just want to say as a 13 year old in today's age, I just want wanted to say thank you because I personally really appreciate the movie from 1986. It's just an awesome movie. And I have a question. Yes. So, um, are you the reason that Jazz died in the first movie that Michael Bay directed? 
Nothing Michael Bay does it comes by way of me. <laughs> I take no responsibility for whatever he did. Okay. None. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, so just wondering, when you were like writing Galvatron, did you, in the movie, did you intend for him to be sort of the same character he ended up in the show? Because, you know, in the show he was kind of crazy and was like bossy and throwing his men around and stuff. Was that you know, Yes, I, I, I wanted him to lose the degree of control that Megatron had exercised. I wanted him to be at war with himself, which Megatron seldom was, because Megatron was a megalomaniac, and everything he did was what should have been done. So I wanted Galvatron to be out of control. So the transmutation, the transformation of Megatron took away some of Megatron's intellectual capabilities. He couldn't handle it all. Hi, follow-up question to that one. Yes. How did you feel working with Leonard Nimoy playing uh, Galvatron? Well, oddly enough, in animation, the writer seldom meets the actors. But I had met Nimoy before, and he was a lovely guy. And uh, I've met a lot of the voice artists on other shows. When I produced the Marvel Action Hour or other things, I would meet a lot of them and often be a voice with them. So uh, uh, only when I produce and own something can I control the casting. Because usually the network, the studio, the money machine, they control the casting. And very often, th they don't really know if an actor is good or bad. Did you enjoy him when he also played Sentinel Prime and then did that little skint of a scene where you see Spock in the movie and, it, and one of the characters goes, oh, this is a scene when Spock goes crazy? In thinking it over, I have no idea what an appropriate answer would be, but I stand behind every word. I guarantee that it is safe, will not harm the children, is soluble in water, and contains no animal fats. Yeah. And, and no animal was harmed during my writing of anything, did except you, I did kick a cat that was urinating on the rug. But that's it. <laughs> did you feel the Galvatron and the Sentinel Prime were pretty much similar to each other? Um, yes and no. This is where the voice artist makes all the difference, because a great voice artist creates a real character out of drawings, out of bits and bytes. If you think about it, if that voice does not give you the character, you're just looking at a drawing. Thank you. Enjoy the movie very much. I'm glad you did. Thank you. Big hand for our guest. Thank you. Thank you. He has a book. My, my it's book called I available. Killed Optimus Prime. I Killed Optimus Prime, <laughs> so sue me. Everything is in it. It'll change your life.